What is up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Roll for Persuasion. I'm your host, Andrew. Welcome to my weekly show where I chat with some of the coolest creatives and entrepreneurs in the Dungeons and Dragons, tabletop gaming, entertainment, nerdy world space. We have awesome people on each and every week, and today is no exception. Very, very excited for our guest today, and we will get to him in just a moment. But first, I want to give a quick shout out to one of the great companies that helps this show happen, Awesome Dice. Dot com. If you want awesome dice, go to awesomedice.com because guess what they have? Uh, would you believe it? They have awesome dice. So if you need some great new dice for your game, they're coming out with new designs all the time. They carry the awesome Chessex Lab set, which I'm a big fan of. So if you want some great dice, go there, check them out. Use the code Roll Persuasion at checkout to save 10% and kick back a little bit to help make this show happen. It's a great, great company full of great people and great dice. So check them out, awesomedice.com. Link is in the show notes as well. So I'm very excited for today's guest. He is somebody who has been on my guest hit list for a while that I finally ended up reaching out to, and now we're talking. And I think it's going to be a really great episode. I'm a huge fan of some of his work, but I will let him tell you about some of that right now. Very excited to welcome Kyle Newman to the show. What's going on, man? Thank you for having me. What an honor. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I'll, I'll give a quick rundown of the things I know about, and then then we'll let you kind of say it in your own words. You are the most recently uh, creator and co-author of... Art and Arcana, the, the kind of illustrated history of Dungeons and Dragons. You recently announced the Heroes Feast, the official D&D cookbook that will be coming out this fall. You also directed a uh, movie that I very much enjoy called Fanboys. Um, you've done some other directing I'm sure we'll talk about. You, you are a busy, busy dude, especially in this world of Dungeons and Dragons. Thank you. Yeah, it's a passion of mine. It's a lifelong passion. And it was wonderful to kind of be, become a part of something that meant so much to me when we released Art and Arcana in 2018. Um, and I got back into playing Dungeons and Dragons in late 2014, 2015, kind of early on with fifth edition. And I was a new father and I don't really go out and party anyway. So it was a great <laughs> reason to have people come over to play games at my house. And right. I've been playing the Star Wars role playing game for mm-hmm. a year or so with Sam Witwer who is one of the co-authors of Art and Arcana, I didn't want to cheat on the Star Wars group right. and start a new Star Wars game. So I was like, I want to play Dungeons and Dragons again. So I picked up the player's handbook and reached out on Facebook to some friends just to feel it out, see who would be in. And within two hours, I had a group. And we had a dungeon master named Thor. And we just assembled that day yeah. and jumped right into it. And it was one of the greatest feelings in the world. And it wasn't just nostalgia to go back and play D&D. I love playing. I love fifth edition. It's just, it's great new memory. Yeah. It's not like I'm trying to recreate the old. And I immediately wanted to go back and check out what I'd missed because I'd kind of fallen out of it for a little bit. Um, and look, what's been going on for the past 10 years or so? And I had a little bit of experience with fourth edition and, you know, kind of looked peripherally in, but I felt there was a, a gaping need for a book that told the history of Dungeons and Dragons and also a visual history of it and the, the evolution of fantasy art. And I reached out to Michael Whitwer, who wrote uh, a book I loved called Empire of Imagination, uh, a sort of bio uh, pick <laughs> novel about Gary yeah. Gygax's life, and it plays very cinematically. And Michael, obviously, is Sam Whitwer's brother. And we knew each other a little bit through the Star Wars community. And he was immediately in. And we assembled this team. And the book came together gracefully and uh, easily. Um, We found our publisher, 10 Speed Press, through Penguin Random House. And Wizards connected us with them and said, you know, there's a great interest here. They want to do some stuff in the space. And before we knew it, we were greenlit to go. And we had such a wonderful experience making that book and promoting that book and connecting to this fandom that's so rich and alive and growing and our publisher uh 10 speed is one of the more prominent cookbook publishers among other things uh, in the world and they reached out to us uh and said How about a cookbook and we were just finishing up our narcana and promoting it and mm-hmm. i was like you know what it makes total sense because you spend so much time at a table conversing and hanging and eating and uh, why not inject it with with great food and food that can add another dimension to your game food that can be themed and add to the immersion 
And it just made sense. You know, there's that camaraderie and family element to dining and to your D&D group. And there's this gaping hole. There was, again, nothing there for, for fans, yet there's this storied history of lore and tales and all these books. You know, every game uh, starting in a tavern, and, right? Yes, and every novel dives yeah. into the cuisine. So we had to do some forensic research backwards and say, all right, well, elves in on Corinne in this region, they mentioned that they eat this at a feast or at this mm-hmm. banquet or at this, and then go back and try to uh, sort as to, okay, what were the ingredients? Maybe somewhere in another book they mentioned that pomegranate and this type of uh, green was available or that they wouldn't eat potatoes or the drow would eat this and uh, deep gnomes would eat this. And so going back into all the different uh, source books, as well as the literature to kind of even your old Aurora's guide, which to just go look at what they were selling, you know, what was made available regionally. And then to do this for also for multiple realms. So this is not just forgotten realms. We dive into, um, we dive into Dragonland and Greyhawk and Eberron. And we touch upon a few of the others, obviously, you know, Ravenloft, um, Saltmarsh. So it's not all um, forgotten realms. Centric, just like right. this edition has kind of broadened itself beyond, you know, the the anchoring launch, which was Forgotten Realms. Uh, so we try to uh, have a broad spectrum look at cuisine and also culture, because so much of so much of um, what we eat and how we eat is based on regionally what's available and culturally how it we wanted to define us. Um, but you look at certain you know cultures like say drow or subterranean and there's only certain things that grow underground there's not a lot of livestock and sure. so you're getting into mushrooms and different types of things and low light so it, it's very true to the to the cultures and also their traditions and it was just a very exciting deep dive both in universe and in our universe to make something that's palatable for and healthy if you want that option, but also yeah. the philosophies of cultures was great. Right, like that, right. there's dwarves might eat more communally, and what types of meat or sauces. Whereas elven food might be more refined and formed to table, and thoughtful about how they treat animals and um, how they would use every part of the animal. So, it. I mean, it is. It, it was a cultural beast of a book. You know, it's, yeah. it's wonderful though to do it with this team again with there was Sam did not partake. So it was Michael Whitworth and John Peterson and John, if you don't know, John Peterson is also one of the greatest historians on gaming. It's not the greatest historian. So he brings so much knowledge about, um, old texts and where we could find things. And it just became a very healthy conversation, just like Art and Arcana would, that we became a think tank and we would vet everything collectively and put our brains together on it. It was not like we just said, you go do this and you go do this. We would we would thoughtfully go through all of our options and right. really narrow it down to what makes this 80-page, 80 uh, recipe menu, which includes drinks and desserts and breads and breakfasts and lunches and snacks and, and dinners. So uh, it's pretty comprehensive. And there's definitely room for a sequel. I'm just putting it out there. <laughs> and and it sounds like very clearly it's safe to say uh, that it is not purely a, uh, oh, we went out and got some recipes and we slapped some art on it and, and gave them funny names, you know, to make a quick buck. Like oh, you said, no. this, was, this is really sounds like it was really like a deep dive, like into the anthropology of, of the worlds and the lore to make everything as like true to the game and the history as possible. It, this is not like, you know, chew baklava it's, right. or wookie cookie. It, this is, <laughs> right. uh, we don't just name things. Yeah. And I'm a fan of the old, um, you know, in the last home books, there's three of them and, and all of those dove into some recipes uh, with mixed success. And obviously mm-hmm. the spiced potatoes are very, um, very popular and have endured. So we have a variation on that, which is explains, you know, this is like a, a regional thing. Um, so we revisit a few old classics, uh, but everything, and you might find some stuff that was mentioned in a book in 1983 that suddenly yeah. is brought to life here. So it's not just like slapping a famous character's name on it, and be like you know, you know, just drumsticks or anything like that. This is like <laughs> these are recipes that are, um, I feel like it's astutely applied to yeah. um, 
regions and cuisine uh, if it isn't stratified prior in some type of source material. So, like I said, we we took a um, we were very, I would say, um, respectful about how we approached or invented. We didn't just do it uh, liberally. We definitely wanted it to feel authentic and true to what came before and true to these different cultures and traditions. That's awesome. Well, I want to I want to dive into Art and Arcana in a second, but but before we do, I'd love to hear how you kind of got into gaming to start because you mentioned that you'd kind of taken a break from D&D and then you started playing again, you said around like 2014-2015. What was it and when was it that you really kind of got introduced to the game and tabletop gaming in general? So, that was very early on in my life. I had some older brothers. They were 10 and 8 years older when I was growing up. So I would be, I was young and I would watch them play these different games. I was always off on the side like Elliot and E.T. while the older brothers played. And I'd visit right. them at Boy Scout camp and they'd be playing in these tents. And they, my one brother, Kevin, uh, had crafted a homebrew uh, Indiana Jones system based on D&D mechanics in the early 80s. And I remember them playing that. And I would flip through the monster manual and learn how to draw, just like I would with Marvel Comics. That's how I learned how yeah. to really draw human shapes and creatures. And I became fascinated. It was like that and Star Wars, which got me interested in the arts and storytelling. And I didn't always get to play, but I got to be around it. I always mm-hmm. wanted to play. And then I started to get into gaming myself when I was just a little bit older. So I played Dungeons and Dragons. I played GURPS, Supers. I did um, Ninja Turtles. And I did the old Star Wars West End game pretty religiously. So it wasn't just I was only D&D, but I loved Dungeons and Dragons on that fantasy side. And it was it was one of the pillars of it. But I was also a big Star Wars West End games person. I'm a Star Wars fanatic. So uh, I played a lot of different systems as a, as a preteen and into my teens. And I probably stopped playing a little bit in college. I was at NYU in the, in the 90s, late 90s. And um, it wasn't as big there, and I was studying film and just didn't have a lot of time to dive into a gaming group. Um, but I would check in on it, and I would pick up some books, and I'd read them, but I just didn't have an active group. Sure. So I could kind of see what was going on and how the game was evolving. And I would still dive in and play the Star Wars game systems when they popped up. Uh, I played the Western games, uh, not the, uh, the Wizards version, which mm-hmm. came out. And I dabbled in that a little bit. Played a little bit of D and D. Um, I was when was it? It was like maybe the late two thousand, mid two thousand. And um, a friend of mine was Kristen Bell, who was in Fanboys, and she yeah. went to an event and brought home. Uh, I was staying with her at the time. She brought home a uh, fourth edition, and I guess maybe they were launching it at the time. And she gave me that box set of stuff. And she's like, you're a nerd. You're going to like this. And I was like, I love D&D. <laughs> so I had that. And I flipped through that. But again, I didn't get a group to play with. But I right. again, familiarized myself with, with the iteration of the game where it was at. And daydreamed about playing. But didn't have the time to take that break. Or didn't really have an active gaming group. I didn't you know, see as many people that were into it. And also it was at a time where people you know, weren't openly talking about it. You know, Joe mm-hmm. Manganiello is a great friend of mine and he, he wrote the forward for Art and Arcana and, he, and Deborah Ann Wallace as well. And they worked on True Blood together, but neither of them realized they both were into Dungeons and Dragons. You know, it wasn't right, so many people yeah. who were openly talking about. So I would talk about it. I mean, a few people be into it, but it just, uh, groups didn't gel together. So it was fortuitous that, you know, I just put this message on Facebook once my Star Wars group had to take a, uh, I hate, I hate it. And, this group assembled and we still play religiously every Tuesday. That's one of my groups. And it's just uh, wonderful having that, that family because those games inspire you to do so many other things. And like it opened up this whole pathway for me to really deeply connect with something that was so important to me in the form of D and D and being able to write the opportunity to write these books and collaborate with some really great minds on them. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it, it's so great to get to take a passion that you've had essentially all of your life, you know, rediscover it a bit, like you said, and then be able to dive in and, and not just partake, but create within that and share um, new new perspectives and new products and, and new created art with other fans. That's, that's got to be just such a, a great feeling. Great. And that's what Fanboys was. 
as a film, you know, being a huge Star Wars fan, being able to go tell, uh, make a film about Star Wars fans and how important fandom was in that time in our lives and just fandom in general. So that was somewhere else where I got, something else where I got to deep dive into something I love so much and so thankful for. Then I got to go do some Star Wars radio dramas. And uh, I think anytime you can go back and, and visit something that, that meant the world to you and get to play in that sandbox beyond just being a fan, but also give it, give it the love that it, it deserves because you're such a big fan is great. Like I don't look at these as a job. I look at this as awesome. I get to carve out this many hours a week to go write about Dungeons and Dragons and think about Dungeons and Dragons. This yeah. is like a bonus, you know, it's incredible. It's a real gift. And obviously everyone I've met up at Wizards has been so supportive in the whole community is just one massive, beautiful family. That's what I discovered while promoting it. That this is such a, a vibrant, large and rich, eclectic community of people. And we're all the same. We all come from different walks of life and different backgrounds and different places. Uh, but D and D means the same thing to us and it means the world. So that's been one of the best gifts. And that was something I was afforded when I made fanboys and connected to the Star Wars community. So I've been very grateful to have those opportunities to play in these sandboxes I love so much. I remember as a, as a huge Star Wars fan, um, I remember hearing about fanboys. Uh, you can pro- you'll be, probably be able to say the dates better than me, but I want to say it was 2006 or 2007, maybe when I first heard about it. It didn't release until um, 2009. 2009. But I, yeah. I remember hearing about it and being like, because it, it came at a point in my life. Uh, see, so in 09, I would have just turned 20. Um, okay. But it came at a time in my life where you know I was going into college, coming out of high school, and just I mean, so much of of who I was was influenced by Star Wars just to huge degrees. They were the, the books I read, the games I played, obviously the films I watched. Um, I was just a huge fan and, and kind of growing up in the, in the world that I did kind of in a very conservative homeschooled world in the South. I, there was not a lot of opportunity to connect with other fans. You know, I'd get the fan club yeah. magazine and I would read about star Wars celebration and dream of getting to go someday. And I would devour every, you know, behind the scenes, piece of you know everything exactly, Steve Sands yeah. wrote about his collection I, I was all over it and so hearing about a movie that kind of essentially was about that right that was about and I and I rewatched the movie last night I was like if I'm going to talk to him about this I'm going to rewatch the movie um so hearing a movie that was about the things I was passionate about and that like you know in in my mind especially at that time going to Skywalker Ranch was like a pilgrimage right so I was like oh my god I can't wait to watch this movie um and then I, I put it on i couldn't see it i don't know if it did it release in theaters it, it had a limited release is that we right did. we did a, a like a road show release so they had about 50 prints of the movie and they would every two weeks like rotate them to maybe 10 different 12 different regions cities mm-hmm. and they did that for a few months which was cool so it actually got out there and connected with fans but they just didn't do a big blanket concerted yeah. release even though the jerks at the Weinstein company contractually obligated to do so. They just didn't do it because mm-hmm. they were promoting the reader that year, I believe. So um, they got a nomination and they pushed another movie and they just screwed our release. Yeah. But that said, Fanboys has found uh, a great audience and some dedicated followers. And like, it's great to hear someone like you connected with it. That was the goal. Was like, I want it to connect to, to the real fans out there, the people that get it. And yeah, it, it was on my it was on my wish list to like get the DVD because I hadn't been oh, able to great. see it on a theater list, and I was trying to explain like to to my family and my girlfriend at the time, like, see, no, 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 it's it's a movie. D- don't worry about, it. just get it for me. <laughs> like, just go find a company yeah. and get it for me. So, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. So, so thank you as a fan. Thank you for that because it was. Um, no, it was I appreciate a great movie. it. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was a labor of love, man. That movie means the world to me. Getting to do that and it took about seven years to get it out in theaters. Eight years. And we're all just Star Wars fans that wanted it to happen and really protect it to the death because we yeah. didn't want people to come in and uh, malign fandom or what it meant to be a fan and, and change the message and disparage fandom in, in any way. It's, yeah, we did it with love. So I'm glad you responded to it. Thank you. Yeah. What was it? What was it? Uh, what was involved in getting some of the different people that you had in the film? I mean, because you had a lot of cameos from. 
uh, Billy D. Williams, Carrie Fisher, Seth Rogen. Uh, I think Danny McBride's in there. Kevin Smith, Ray Park, like William Shatner. Like you have just a whole kind of laundry list of of yeah, awesome people. Kevin how Smith did, and yeah, well, how did you go and get all that? It was yeah. awesome. You know, it just started. Uh, we just started. The boulder started rolling. Mm-hmm. And things just started like the snowball effect, and um, uh, we. I'm trying to think. Well, once we got George Lucas's blessing, it kind of opened the floodgates of the thing. Sure. So, um, Carrie, we got Carrie Fisher involved. Billy D uh, was excited to become a part of it, and Ray. And I wanted some pillars from Star Wars, uh, some iconic faces. Uh, I I became friends with Mark Hamill and had multiple conversations with him about it. We just couldn't find the right uh, role for him. He was originally right. going to maybe be uh, head of security at Lucasfilm, but it felt too close to home. Right. Like working at Lucasfilm all these years later, and it just, we couldn't find the right cameo for him, um, where he could affect the story in a positive way, like Carrie Fisher's character does. Mm-hmm. Um, so that unfortunately didn't work out. Shatner uh, was just wonderful and playful, and he came down for a day to work with us, and he really didn't understand. He's like, "What is this all about? Star Wars versus <laughs> Star Trek?" Like, like, what do you mean? It's like you're you're trying to stir up trouble, aren't you? I'm like, no, this is like a real rivalry, dude. It's like, what are you yeah, talking about? Yeah. Uh, at the time when this is set in '98, there really wasn't much. Harry Potter wasn't a thing. Yeah, Transformers were rusting away. Uh, GI Joe hadn't been revitalized in any way. There wasn't like the He Man, Thundercat, any '80s mm-hmm. revival in in big swing. There were no new franchises. Um, the pillars of of geekdom were Star Wars and Star Trek. Marvel wasn't a thing yet. You know, they really weren't having success with superhero movies. Mm-hmm. So when the movie was set in 98, it was this vacuum and Star Wars was the biggest thing in the world and Star Trek was its only real rival other than, you know, was it like Farscape or Battle on Five. There really, it, was, right. it was desolate times. And, um, you know, those two were, were at odds. There was some jockeying. And I love both. I grew up, you know, when Star Wars wasn't around, I got really into Next Generation. I was a huge Star Trek fan. Uh, if I had to, if you put a gun to my head and said pick one, I would, I would pick Star Wars. But thankfully, no one's putting a gun to my head. You know, I love <laughs> yeah. them both. Yeah. And that was so we we put that in there, and he thought that was funny. And I really couldn't believe he didn't think there was like a rivalry. Yeah. Um, it was wonderful working with Billy D. Who uh, I, there's there's this crazy story. So one of the first days before shooting, um. Billy D was scheduled to work really early on, and uh, they scheduled his dinner. Billy D Williams flew into um, New Mexico where we were shooting, and I scheduled that dinner with him. So right then, I get a message uh, from one of the producers like, "Actually, we scheduled a phone call with Carrie Fisher I'm like during my dinner with Billy D Williams. Are you guys insane? Like, <laughs> this, this is Lando. I want to talk to him. Like, yeah, just run upstairs yeah. for half hour, talk to her, and then come back to dinner." And he understood that they, they prefaced him that I had to talk to Carrie briefly before she put So I leave this dinner and he starts talking about Empire Strikes Back. I'm like, damn it. All right. So I go upstairs, I call Carrie Fisher and there's, I have this amazing phone call with Carrie Fisher. She's talking yeah. about, you know, like her 50th birthday party back when George came and Gipsy got her and they were, you know, just her relationship with, with Paul Simon and she's getting into everything, you know? Mm-hmm. And then, um, I run back downstairs and just as I sit down at the table to rejoin the conversation with Billy D. Williams and he's like, that's all I've got to say about Star Wars. I'm like, <laughs> wait, what? Like, and I'm no, going, no, no. And then I'm like, wait, what is he talking about? Like, I don't know. He said something about like some empire. What's that one? The fourth one? I'm like, Shh, what? What are you talking about? Like, <laughs> you don't remember what he's talking about? And they're like, I don't know. It was really funny, but I didn't write it down. So I missed this whole Billy D. Um, decompressed storytelling on yeah. his experience with Empire and Jedi, and then he kind of stopped talking about Star Wars. Oh, man. So, but Wait, I got if, this if awesome you're going to miss that, yeah, talking to Carrie Fisher is a good reason. I mean, you know, that's a that's a nice follow up prize, I suppose. I was like, what kind of asshole schedule two of the greatest <laughs> conversations you could have in your life at the same time? Like, couldn't you just separate them by two hours? Right, like, right. So that was my life, you know. But it was. It was wonderful. I got to meet George Lucas. I was one of the only people to ever be granted the opportunity to shoot on at Skywalker Ranch. Yeah, I think we were the first. That wasn't like a news crew. 
Right. That wasn't a George production to be able to go shoot up there. He let us shoot at the exterior of the main house. And we had no money, so we were lighting Skywalker Ranch, the main house with car headlights. Yeah. It was it was a pretty crummy way to go about something when you have the wonderful opportunity to go put sure. finishing touches on this movie and landmark it that they made it to this historic place that is like you said, it's just like like going there. It's like holy grail, you know, like, it's like a life dream. Right. Uh, so we're there getting to shoot, but we don't have the resources to do it properly. So yeah. that was like the story of that movie. Um, but at least we got to go there. At least we made the pilgrimage. And we authentically shot there. And George, you know, had my back with the cut of the movie. And, you know, it was just a, a life-changing experience. Well, that's awesome. I mean, like I said, you know, it's such a, a great thing to watch as a fan. And, and honestly, it's great to get to talk to you about it now. Um, you know, years after, after watching it and getting to rewatch it last night, uh, it's, it's just, it's a great thing. And I'm glad that you were able oh, to thank you. put it into the universe, you know? Oh, I really appreciate that. Yeah. I, I it was a, a tough journey, but I wouldn't change a thing. Sure. I want to take a real quick second. We're going to dive into Art and Arcana, but I want to give a shout out to another one of my awesome sponsors. I want to say thank you to the people at Talon and Claw who make uh, many, many awesome wooden accessories for your D&D games. I have several of them protecting my dice right now. They make beautiful custom DM screens and dice vaults, and they're coming out with rolling trays soon and just beautiful handmade wooden stuff. So if you guys need that kind of stuff for your tabletop games, go check them out, talonandclaw.etsy.com. They are huge supporters of the show. They've been on the show before. Anthony's going to be in a game I'm running soon for um, Jasper's Game Day. So just great members of the community. Small business. Glad that we can support them and appreciate the support on the show. If you use the code Roll Persuasion on their shop, talentandclaw.etsy.com, you can save that 10% as well, and they will support the show too. So it's a great way to support both of us. So thank you to them. Thank you to you guys for supporting them and supporting us. And we are big, big fans of talent and claw my i actually have three different things on my desk right now so big fan and of course they help make the show happen so we appreciate that too but diving back in um art and arcana i'll get at risk of sounding like i'm just wildly blowing smoke up your ass um if if people go back and listen to this show i probably at least for the first i don't know six months of the show i probably mentioned art and arcana every other episode with various guests just because it is such a fantastic like touch point and kind of uh, you know repository of D and D history and knowledge. As someone who came into into D and D with fifth edition, um, you know, kind of late to the game, probably 2016, I, I received it as a gift uh, last year. I guess just about a year ago uh, from someone who was like, "Look, this says D and D. Do you want it?" And I was like, "Sure." And then I just read the whole thing in a day, and I was just completely absorbed by this book and the way I was able to learn about the history of um, Gygax and the company and the differences uh, in additions and the growth of art and just all of this information that, that I, I don't think I would have been able to learn otherwise. So it really is just kind of a, it's a bit of a masterpiece for anyone who wants to just get in and absorb, not just beautiful art, but the history of this game. And, and for you, how did that kind of come together? You touched on it a bit briefly, but what was it like actually assembling that book. Well, first of all, thank you for all the kind words about it, for spreading the gospel. Um, <laughs> for sure. I, as a fan too, it's exactly the book that I wanted a book as a fan. I went out and yeah. looked for the book. I went to Amazon. I scoured eBay. I'm like, surely there's a book like this. Where is it? And I had some of the old art books, you know, Art of Dragonlance, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But I was really searching for a comprehensive coffee table book. Right. I, I realized there was nothing. I was like, well, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna make the book, and yeah. I was like, why not? And then uh, I reached, like I said, I reached out to Michael first because he had some recent experience publishing and working in D and D, and he had a lot of ideas. But my vision for the book was um, like a time machine. They, it would take you through the pre-release, the inception of it, all the way up through the current iteration. And I, I was an art history minor at New York University. I love art history and the evolution of art. I thought it would be a good way to look at the evolution of fantasy art and also the importance of of D and D, the visualization of D and D and how it's affected um, other media and games. And obviously it started very crudely and but beautifully um, and what it's evolved into. And 
what was wonderful about the early art was that it was informative. These were tools, just mechanical tools to tell you how to play the game. Informative. Right. Oh, you can do this. You can steal treasure. You can stab someone in the back. You can, you can, it just showed you what you could do to bring to life some of the, the mechanical text of the game. Um, so a person could feel how it could come to life, what these worlds might look like. But they weren't supposed to be definitive vistas on this is how it has to be. They were, they were suggestive, and they were basically drawn and largely black and white. So uh, it was almost like the cave paintings. You know, they were very basic. And that's the, the nascent place where D&D began. It served a purpose. And um, so we, we formed our team, and Sam's like, wait, you're doing a book with my brother, you dick? <laughs> I want to get involved in this. I love D&D. And I'm like, well, of course. So we, we formed, a, formed what we thought was, we still feel like, was a really super team. Everyone brought different background and history to it and a totally different POV. And it would have been a very different book had I just set out to do it alone or if any of us did it alone. Um, we all had periods and, and realms we were more excited about. Mm-hmm. So I got saddled with some of the Spelljammer stuff. I don't, know, I don't want to write Spelljammer. And I was like, I'll, I'll write about Spelljammer. I'll take on some Dark Swan and let's do all this. Uh, so we each kind of went to where some of our passions were and could pour that passion into those areas to make sure this thing was so complete. So we met up in Los Angeles at my house. And um, John spends a lot of time in Maine and San Diego. I think he flew in from Maine and Michael came up from Chicago and Sam was in town and we spent like two days deep diving. We just all brought all our ideas for iconic imagery and things that had to be touched upon. And we just created a massive folder, of thousands and thousands of images uh, that we felt had worth. And then we started to you know, realize we just didn't want to put the obvious. We want to look at how the game was merchandised, how the game marketed what are some of the big turning points in the way the game was marketed? How was it uh, presented in other media? How has the perception of the game changed from it being like, look at it now and it's kind of, it's cool and it's getting some mainstream love, but look at it in the past and it was tainted with Satanism or it was instant pariah status. And so our uh, public relationship with the game has changed. I think that's because people's fantasy vernacular has evolved and people's familiarity with fantasy because of Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and Harry Potter and all of these things, they're not taboo anymore. People are like, well, I like this stuff. This isn't weird. Where yeah. you looked at it in the 80s and you, you might have been considered a, a freak because this is the stuff you were into. So everyone's more into it now collectively and there's a, there's like a, a shorthand to it. So that's why I think 5e works really well. And these are some of the epiphanies we had and and the observations we made as to why did the game survive and why is it now bigger than ever? Uh, you can learn the game in 10 minutes. You know, it's not as, it, it, it's not as scary in terms of being as literary or mathematic as it right. was prior. And there are these entry points and there's YouTube tutorials and there's ways to watch people play the game. So it's not so strange and abstract. You're like, Oh, that's all it is. You get around and laugh and tell a story. Um, so, it's easier now to comprehend what D&D is because so many people have copied it. And the foundations of it changed the way games were played and made. Video games, and computer games, and, and uh, other tabletop games. So uh, we wanted to trace all of this through the book and not just be like uh, a compendium of, of important images and covers. Uh, so we decided to get into... Um, ephemera and memorabilia and everything from like record books and shrinky dinks to uh, belt buckles and animation cell art and you know also marketing and um unseen sketches of covers that became important or art that was foundational and uh, what what did the layouts look like or how did they come about the ideas for them so it was a huge task. And we said, we want to do all of this. So when mm-hmm. we pitched a book that was very simply a visual history, uh, we also quickly realized we needed to match it with the history. So you can read this book, and it is a, a more or less linear narrative history that you can right. read. You can also flip through the book and experience it visually. So we wanted to work on different levels, and they also work um, together. 
So we spent a lot of time after the book was written mapping the book out, laying it all out on the floor and looking at it in a, in a macro way. This is where my, my filmmaker skills come in and visual yeah. skills. And I just wanted it to look and each page to feel like a spread that told the story. And then the words had to be a, applicable or at least comment on or contrast what was being visually presented and coming up with some of those techniques like the evolutions and the many faces of and the the evolution of the visuals. Why why did a certain character or culture get depicted one way initially? What about it evolved throughout the iterations of the game? What survived visually and why? Why does why does the beholder look differently or drow look differently? Mm -hmm. So we tried to roll up our sleeves and look at all these different questions, and it was a massive undertaking. I mean, we there's there's a sequel in that one. It, it, there's a lot we could barely scratch the surface of, but I still think we did a a, a pretty um, competent job conveying all these big ideas and letting you look at the game and think about the game you love in a new, enlightened way, raising some good questions. Uh, positing some ideas that people maybe hadn't thought of before about the importance of D&D on greater culture. Um, and when you can put it all together like that, you realize cumulatively that there, it, it was a, a massive game changer in our culture. And so many storytellers and so many other stories have borrowed from it very liberally, and a lot of times without credit, um, because it, it was that much in the zeitgeist. And, and it permeated so many parts of our of our culture, and I think that's the the ultimate value of the book. Which is, even if we can't put everything in there, we set out and promised ourselves that we would make something that had weight to it, that asked great questions, and was chock full of stuff. So you could kind of go down some of these paths and extrapolate further right. about the importance of it. You're like, oh, whoa, 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 I remember that. And I, oh, it does do this. And maybe you're going to go off on your own. We just couldn't go off on every tangent because it's just, it doesn't suit the format of a book. And we just didn't have the page space and they gave us extra pages and they gave us extra room for images. And it still felt like we were having to make major cuts to tell the story in a broader sense. And the first two chapters get, we get to deep dive fairly well. And thankfully, John Peterson, being the consummate expert he is, had a, a trove of items and, and, and paperwork that no one had ever seen before. And we could kind of map some of that stuff out and really tell the story. You know, a lot of half the original artists were females. You know, people don't realize some of these things. Mm -hmm. And there's an amateur quality to it all, but that amateur quality actually created a certain vibe because D&D &D is a it, it's always been a, a catch-all and an amalgamation of different people's styles and arts. There is no one D&D &D look. You know, if you say, what is Star Wars? It has an intrinsic vibe right. and feel to it that's normally um, laced with the talents of Ralph McQuarrie or Joe Johnston. You know, like those guys, like that, their style still is indicative and infused with all future Star Wars. You really aren't changing it. But, D and D had so many wild and zany and unique artists all telling their iterations and interpretations, and um, I just thought that was uh, that's what's so special about it. To Dragon Magazine and things like that became breeding grounds for new mm -hmm. artists and new voices, and they were looking to expand that. And it was always very inclusive, and it always let you know that as a dungeon master, as a player, you had the freedom to breathe your own life into it. And just the vast collection of voices and talents, um, again, by presenting it that way, you realize, okay, there, there are so many different ways to play D&D, to tell the story, and to visualize D&D. &D. Uh, so it's hard to really codify it into one singular look or feel. Uh, but that is important. That is, that makes it Dungeons and Dragons. So, right. because you have all these realms and they're all, uh, they each have their own feel. Um, 
So I learned as a fan more than I ever could have imagined. And I <laughs> yeah, love yeah, that. I, yeah. I don't like, I don't like writing about what you know. A lot of people say write what you know. Mm-hmm. And I think that's boring. I want to write what I want to know. Mm-hmm. So yeah. if I already know it, I'm an expert and I'm just regurgitating and I'm going to just put it right out there. I wasn't an expert. I knew a lot and I was a big fan. But uh, there are people that know more about all this than me, especially certain areas. But I could, with my passion, congeal it all together with the team and tell it in a great way. And that, right. I think, was what was important, what I could bring to it. Um, John knows more than all of us. You know, he could have written his own version of it. But because we did this together, it was like an Avengers version. We could all tell it in a, in a very, very unique and macro way that allowed us to deep dive when we needed to very specifically with the accurate detail as it was required. And we weren't sure how that was going to happen when you have four people writing a book together. Like, what's the voice? And yeah. we found a collective voice purely because we spent so much time brainstorming and uh, as a think tank. And I think that made us, uh, gave us the healthiest approach and allowed us to tell such, I feel like, an authentic version of the brand's history as it coincides with pop culture. Well, definitely. I mean, like I said, it's, it's kind of a master collection of history and interviews and obviously the art, but it kind of helps you see the through line from, you know, the very early, you know, Gygax war game days to, you know, bringing us into fifth edition now. So I, I've definitely, I've, I've given it away as a prize on Twitter. I, I encourage people to read it actively because it's such a, a fun read. I ended up uh, going out after I got my first copy and getting the, uh, the special edition. And I'm curious. Oh, yeah, because because in that, I mean, obviously it comes in a cool box and it's got the cool uh, Hydra 74 cover and and art prints, but it's also got that kind of reproduction of the Tomb of Horrors adventure module. And and what was what was kind of y'all's mindset and what you wanted to include in that special edition? Like, how did you land on doing Tomb of Horrors? Like, what other ideas did you have to include in that that maybe didn't end up in the box? Well, we were looking at two, like a, a dice tray. I wanted to add stuff that would add some value, something unique. Um, obviously, we John had access to this. He owned that original. Um, we didn't have own it, but he had access to it. And um, we could then get the permission to publish something like that. We wanted to do something that was uh, untapped and largely unseen. Right. That would add some great value to it. And we wanted to add... Um, Initially, I was I, I was thinking it might work out. Obviously, it's very expensive when you're doing a large book with a special hydro slipcase, um, publishing and weight and all that format size. There's a lot of limitations, but getting some art that we thought was poster worthy, print worthy, um, our marginal special edition also allowed us to deep dive into maps and cartography, which was a which was a portion of the book that we we kind of wanted to get into more, but we couldn't based on page counts. We were able to reuse or revisit some of that content, which we didn't get to deep dive on as the gatefolds for the Barnes and Noble um, edition. It's a red mm-hmm. cover version, which is also, you, I think they're still available at Barnes and Noble if you see that one. It's definitely worth it if you're a map or a cartography person um, because that's a huge part of Dungeons and Dragons and, and the player experience and getting to you know, reproduce a few of those in there. It's cool. Um, so we brainstormed a lot. We talked about dice. We talked about, you know, things like the Tomb of Horrors um, and, and art, um, stuff that you might want to take out of that book and put in a frame. Um, and just didn't want to also do the obvious, but we wanted to get into some stuff we felt um, told a story. So if it didn't right. add to the story we needed to tell, it didn't need to be in there. You can go find a lot of this. Well, the, the philosophy also is you can find a lot of this art online. Mm-hmm. You can go, oh, okay, what's that cover? Cool, that's the box cover, that's the art. Um, showing it in its native form, free of trade dress and logo, was also was also something we strove for. Uh, showing it in a concept form was cool. And if it was a good piece of art but it didn't have a great story, then maybe it doesn't belong in this book because you know we're trying to... Uh, 
to tell a narrative here. Um, so everything had to pass like certain, certain um, checks before it made the grade and made it into our final selection. Even then, once we laid the book out, we realized, yeah, the book needs to breathe a little more. And we yeah. need some more space and, and the text that's all jammed up. So sometimes we have to take a few things that we love. Or maybe there's two or three things and we have to just make that a choice and say, which one of these three is telling it better? And and find that healthy mix of concept and unseen and, and also classic. So, um, same, same applied to when we were putting the, the box set together and, and whittling it down to what made it in there. I felt like every single thing was like a Sophie's Choice kind of yeah. situation. Well, again, um, I'll tell everyone, uh, if you go find this at the library, find it online. It's a, it's a great book to read, especially if you love D and D. Um, I know that, that we're, we're up against it a little bit, but I did want to ask you before we kind of close out, um, if you can, what can, can you give me a small glimpse into what it's like playing in a uh, Joe's death saves like home game? Cause we see, we okay. see like the pictures on like Instagram and it, and it just, I mean, it looks like the craziest, coolest place to play. What, what is that game like? It is pure passion. And it's very old school. Obviously, yeah. we're having to play through the pandemic um, with Roll20 and do it digitally. Uh, traditionally, we would play very... We would get into some good tabletop wargaming. You know, it was, yeah. there was a lot of tactical combat and Joe had some amazing builds. Um all you know, our friends at Dwarven Forge make some of the, the coolest stuff I've ever seen. And Joe is a big fan of it. And he a collector. And he has the, his, the most extensive collection of minis uh, with kids and beyond I've ever seen in my life. So you'd be like, oh, I have a lavender walrus. And suddenly he's like, hold on. And he goes into a cabin. And he comes out with like exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. Yeah. Whether it's the most random familiar or... You know, your druid shapeshift into this, he's got it, right. you know, or something very close. It's pretty incredible. And it's beyond expensive. It is, um, it is a museum of mini, but sadly, you haven't been able to play with mini. And we've, we've carved out a great way of playing, uh, roll 20. We were playing twice a week on the early, early, uh, COVID. And, yeah. uh, that's a lot as a DM for, for Joe to prepare. We have 11 players. And to prepare for that, the scale of every combat is is massive and epic, and and he does it so boldly and authentically, and the storytelling is supreme, and everybody brings their a game to it, and it's just incredible being part of a group like that. Um, there's he's got a famous comic book artist interpreting our whole group their characters right oh, now wow. yeah and we'd like to do more with, with it uh it's something that's private sure. um we want to keep it up like, why don't you stream the game and we're like it's a home game right you know yeah. not, and then not you every, stream not every game, game has changes. to be streamed yeah yeah why and why do we have to you know why does it have to be done that way um yeah. you're allowed to have home games and a lot of people still want to retain their privacy and there are a lot of you know high profile people in it, you know, sure. we've got like you know, DB Weiss, from Game of Thrones and his partner, uh, Dave Benioff, they've played a few times, uh, Tom Morello, you know, from Rage Against the Machine and the big mm-hmm. show from WWE and Vince Vaughn. And, you know, it's just like an amazing group of people that bring a, a life of passion to it and it means the world to them. So being a part of that is incredible. You know, we have yeah. some side conversations where just the casters will meet you know, or just the fighters will meet one week and talk, you know, about yeah. um, philosophy, just like if this is the conversations we maybe have at a campfire, you know, outside of the game. And um, so uh, it's not like uh, we meet once a week and just check in. This is like, we think about it every day and there's a chat going every day talking yeah. about the game. It is pretty incredible. It's immense. Uh, I'm, I'm thankful to be be a part of it and it's, it's been cool watching it evolve through what was like a get together and joe's gary guy memorial dungeon now is this 
really cool online get together. It's like a little, little family, you know? So, yeah. um, yeah, it's, it's one of a kind and I'm very uh, glad to be a part of it. It's one of the coolest games I've ever played in my life. So I'm playing a, a half orc zealot barbarian. And I okay. love that class. If you haven't played the zealot, it's pretty damn awesome. And, um, yeah, I'm having a great time playing. I, I normally go for casters, and yeah. I just like it, it. It affords you, you challenge you to be to read more, learn spells, and and um, be that that uh, Swiss Army knife. You know, it gives you more options. I always feel like wizards and stuff. However, there's something refreshing about playing like a just a straight up barbarian and then you spend yeah. some more of your time getting into the character of it so um yeah i'm playing that right now i'm playing um uh avernus um i'm playing a conquest paladin a female azimar and we're getting high level in that i'm like a level 11 i think i'm a level 11 in um our game um Game. And I'm in the middle of Mad Mage with Joe and some other people. And Joe's a player. Um, the war from our Tuesday night game is the DM, and Craig Mason is the you know, creator, I and mean, guy from Chernobyl in our group. And it's just an awesome descent into Mad Mage, and I'm playing a, a War Mage in that one with like level 12. So I'm getting pretty high level in all these games, and they've been really evolving well over the, over the uh, pandemic. That's awesome, man. I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm struggling to, uh, you know, I think as many of us are, you know, be able to schedule our, our one game. Um, so it's, it's got, it's gotta be great to, to have, <laughs> have multiple awesome games with uh, great groups of people that you can you know, just be diving into different characters and different stories. And, uh, that just sounds, that sounds awesome. Yeah. I am, I'm, I'm thankful and blessed to be part of these, these great groups. And we don't get to play every week. We try to make sure something work or something comes up. But, you know, I'd say it's like three out of four sessions normally happen. The weeks where they all happen at once, you're like, oh, my God, there's a lot of Dungeons & Dragons, especially yeah. when we played twice a week in one game. There was like four nights of it. Yeah. And that's, that's hard to sustain. You know, so that's a very intense um, order to, to do all that. But it's d d It's almost worth it. <laughs> For sure. Um. Well, dude, uh, man, thank you so much. This has been so much fun. I, I was so excited when you said you were down to talk and, um, I'm glad we got to dig into all the different things that we did. Um, obviously heroes feast is coming up and we'll drop a link in the show notes, but is there anything thank else you, you want to share or, or, you know, where can people check you out online? Um, if they want to get in touch with you. Well, I'm honored to be a guest on the show. We've got some amazing people. So I am thrilled to be on here. Um, well, thank you. As a guest, so, um, so many other luminary people, and you're doing such a great job with this show, so keep it up. Um, yeah, the, you can find me online. I'm Kyle underscore Newman on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, always down to talk Dungeons and Dragons. I also contribute to the Los Angeles D and D Society. That's on Instagram. I think there's a Facebook thing. Getting a lot of good uh, community building out there, and there's some other chapters for me. And then um, let's see. Uh, Heroes Feast is coming out October 27th through Penguin Random House and 10 Speed Press in association with, with uh, Wizards of the Coast. And it's the official D&D cookbook, and there's never been one. So we are really uh, just, just overwhelmed by everyone's excitement about it, too. It really just shows that there's this hunger for it, no pun intended. <laughs> um, and yeah, the community's been like, bring it. So we're excited. October 27th. Uh, you can pre-order now. Amazon, uh, Barnes and Noble has a special edition, uh, which is cool. Not as expensive as the Arcana special edition, but it has an alternate cover, and it's got a Jared Blondo map, which is a um, almost like an antique look back at the cuisine of the Forgotten Realms in the Sword Coast. So it's a pretty cool fold-out gatefold map, um, and Arnacana obviously is still available everywhere. If you haven't checked it out, I mean, it is a, if you know someone that loves Dungeons and Dragons, it's just the perfect gift for them because uh, even if you're just new to fifth edition, it gives you a frame of reference as to 
why Fifth Edition is working the way it is and where it borrows from all the old editions. And also the stories. There's so many stories in Fifth Edition to harken back um, or are plays upon old or reinventions of old tales and classic ones. And it kind of blows your mind to realize just how enduring some of these adventures and tales are. So it's a great, they're, bo- they're both great gifts. I think Heroes for the East will be something that you can actually add a, add a real dimension of life to your table and push away the Doritos and and get something cool that's germane to the story. There's like cinnamon elven bread or something going on that might um, enliven what, what's unfolding in your game. And that, that was our desire. So I hope it, it does that for you. And it's got a much lower price point. So um, it should make it more accessible to people. Um, but I'm always down to talk Dungeons and Dragons. Find me online, Kyle underscore Newman. And also have a fan, Facebook uh, fan page. So again, thanks for having me on. Yeah, man. And uh, for those of you who are supporters of the show, Patreon, patreon.com slash roll for persuasion. You guys know that if you stick around after the outro music, we will have a little bonus segment with myself and Kyle. I'm not sure what we're going to talk about, but I bet it's going to be fun. Um, you know, we could talk about soccer. I think you're an Arsenal fan, so maybe we could just talk about uh, yeah. talk about that. I'm very disappointed with them winning the FA Cup, so maybe that can be the whole conversation. <laughs> okay. But if you want to hear uh, those bonus segments, you can hear all previous episodes and all future guests. You can come support the show. Five bucks a month, patreon.com slash roll for persuasion to get access to those and a big thank you to smugglers coffee for making sure that zone of truth segment happens each and every week go to store.smugglerscoffee.com for the best coffee in the galaxy if you love nerdy stuff and you love nerdy coffee they are the people for you so check out smugglers coffee this has been yet another episode of roll for persuasion big thank you to my guest kyle for joining me looking forward to chatting with him a bit more here in a few minutes as always make sure you follow the show at roll persuasion on twitter and instagram leave us a review on apple Podcasts or podchaser.com go to the newly relaunched roll for persuasion.com to get access to all the episodes um cool articles i'll be putting up we got some cool stuff for sale i've been putting together hats and shirts and you know if you're one of those people who needs more merch in your life come get it from me roll for persuasion Dot com. Always feel free to hit me up on social media as well. Love chatting with you guys. And until next time, guys, enjoy your games. Mm-hmm.